All right, NNG 808, the cutting edge. I'm Jay Fidel, and the handsome guy is Marco Mangelsdorf. Hi, handsome. <laughs> You're too kind. You're too kind. I don't know if that's the, the pot calling the kettle black or the other way around, <laughs> Jay. But, uh, Great to be back with you, uh, as always. Thank you. Mark Marco is uh, the, uh, the president and CEO of uh, Prohibition Solar in Hilo. He joins us by Zoom from Hilo, and we meet every couple of weeks to, um, to get a bead on energy in Hawaii. And, and uh, today we've got plenty of action. And what's remarkable about that uh, is that, you know, America is burning with COVID. And uh, in fact, and to a certain degree, so is Hawaii. And um, still, there's developments and action in energy. And so we made a list of things we want to report to you on. This is not everything, but this is a number of things of interest. So, uh, Marco, let's see, where will we begin? Um, let's see where we will begin. Uh, there are uh, several things that I can't find them now. Uh, where will we begin? Let's talk about solar, always near and dear to my heart. Yeah, yeah, sure. That's your business. Last thing I remember is that solar was going up. And I heard that from somebody else in the industry. Solar is going up. Installations are going up. Well, it's an interesting contrast, Jay, because not too many months ago, the, the so-called solar parties uh, on Oahu uh, essentially uh, started ringing the alarm bell with the Public Utilities Commission and, uh, and Hawaiian Electric saying that uh, the sky was falling, that jobs were being lost, that the industry was in danger of devastation. And uh, lo and behold, you know, the data over the first six months of the year across the state, uh, PV permits overall are up 40, 40 percent across Hawaii's four counties. So it's hard to jive uh, lamentations about the skies falling with the 40 percent increase. Uh, yes, but why? Why, why what? Well, people are getting into contracts for installation of solar. Uh, at a time when you know everybody is like hiding at home in hermit fashion, why are they doing that? Are they? they is it because they're focusing on home? Is it? It's the same reason <laughs> that Home Depot is active these days. <laughs> I think there's something of a kind of a safe harbor attitude. That tens of thousands of dollars, seventy-five percent of all new systems being permitted have battery storage, and that's. Uh, been pretty steady from last year to this year, about three quarters. So battery storage equals resiliency and backup in case the grid goes down. And the reality as well is that the federal tax credit for solar is 26% this year. And as of next January 1, it goes to 22%. So we've, we've known over the years, over the decades, that one way to motivate people to jump is to, uh, to threaten to take away an incentive or an incentive going down. So I believe as well that the tax credit going down by 4% is not trivial. So it's, uh, I won't call it a perfect storm, but all these factors play into the greater uh, march to people wanting to sign contracts. Uh, Vivint Solar, which was recently purchased by, or will be purchased by Sunrun, uh, makes for a juggernaut now in terms of solar leasing. Uh, companies that are doing business across the U.S. and Vivint has come back big time, especially on Oahu, over the past couple of years. So uh, clearly there's still a market out there. And even though net energy metering went away, gosh, going on five years ago, so the incentive to go solar is less now in terms of utility uh, interconnect programs, uh, it's clear that it's still seen as a good investment by no small number of homeowners and business owners who didn't jump four, five, 10, 15 years ago. I wonder if they, they worry about the, you know, the supply of electricity and they want to have the ability to go on, on off the grid essentially and have their own source. Um, given not only the, you know, the, the risk of that, but the risk of storms, which could also disrupt the power. Um, so it could be that. I wonder about that. Yeah, I mean, if you look at if you look at the percentage of time when Hiko, Helco, Miko, and KIUC are offline, it's an it's a very very small percentage. And mm -hmm. uh, so I don't think there is the perception that the availability of utility power at present and in the recent past has been at risk. But I think, given kind of the overall level, greater level of anxiety and concern uh, based on COVID, based on economic conditions. Again, I, I kind of go back to 
it is a type of insurance policy when you're going solar, especially solar with storage. And those people who can afford to do so and those people who are willing to, to take on a lease or take on a loan uh, are, are they're, they're voting with their, their pocketbook, so to speak, that they see this type of investment in not a few thousand dollars, but you know, in the 10 to 100,000 range easily these yeah. days for solar plus doors. No, I guess, so, I guess the, the, the financing is available. The banks are leasing companies are willing to do it. That makes it uh, easier. Back to the storms for a minute. You know, it's very interesting about the storms. Um, perhaps, um, you know, there won't be so many storms. You know, we, we don't have as much carbon going in the, into the atmosphere. Uh, we don't have as, as much disruption um, in, in the climate change continuum because the economies of the world are down. I've seen a couple of articles along those lines. <clears throat> I'm not sure that people understand that or make the connection, <clears throat> but that's a factor uh, going to the question of storms. Well, I hadn't heard that, Jay, and I gotta believe given the, the magnitude of the, the global ecosystem that the reduction of G, uh, greenhouse gases and carbon dioxide over the past several months, uh, what effects that's gonna have in terms of climate activity, there's gonna be a substantial lag. So, you know, uh, I'm not gonna say uh, surely you're joking and I am calling you surely, Jay, but it seems to me that uh, uh, any type of uh, effect on the global climate in terms of super storms or greater, degree, uh, more monsoons, more fierce monsoons, mon more fierce hurricanes, that that's gonna play out over a considerably longer period of time than just a few months. Well, okay, um, I, I don't have to be optimistic. I can be negative about this too and say they're coming. Uh, we're in the storm period already. We're in July and uh, we could have a storm any day. I always say you walk outside, see the sun shining, beautiful weather like right now today. We're one day closer to a major storm. Um, <clears throat> and that's certainly gonna disrupt everything. And uh, disrupting everything in a time of COVID is particularly you know, troublesome. Anyway, let's go to the second point. Um, and that is, uh, oh, uh, Huhonua. Huhonua, you know, you were talking about Huhonua a long time ago and questioning whether it was the right move and uh, the Supreme Court didn't like it much. And uh, the, the PUC finally, uh, on the remand from the Supreme Court, decided uh, that it was not, uh, that it was not good for the environment, right? Well, the, in a major decision, uh, gosh, this goes back about, um, fall of 2018, I'm, I'm tempted to say October 2018, and this is all due to uh, to Henry Curtis suing uh, for the the commission to look at that decision again in light of greenhouse gases. And again, full kudos to Henry Curtis for for being that one the sole voice there that was pushing the right cause. So he got a unanimous decision. I believe it was unanimous uh, uh, last year from the Hawaii Supreme Court, and the commission, the Public Utilities Commission, issued a decision and order uh, just last week that uh, formally said uh, or rescinded rescinded their approval of the power purchase agreement between Helco and Huhonua uh, that went back to 2017. So uh, I think it was an absolutely fantastic decision. I'm, I'm extremely pleased that the three commissioners, uh, Jay Griffin, Jenny Potter, and Leo Asensio made the decision that they did. And my position all along, Jay, has been that uh, we need clean, green power across the state, cost-effective, clean, green power. And any type of new power generation that is combustion-based of any, any source, regardless of the fuel source, is something we simply cannot do. Uh, so I think, uh, fingers crossed, that this $350 million project, uh, according to Hujono, they've already spent $350 million in climbing, that this will be the end of it. Uh, I don't get any particular pleasure that uh, a business uh, is losing a whole bunch of money or that they're going to have to write off a bunch of that money, but it was definitely the best and right decision for this island. It was the best and right decision for the state of Hawaii to put an end to any new power generation that is combustion based. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I'm much less enthusiastic about this. Um, $350 million is, is a lot of money. It's not just so much that they lost that money, it's, it's gone. It's a, you might as well throw it away at this point. Um, it's that uh, they got a permit. They went through the process and got a permit. 
Uh, and then it was uh, up to an appeal. I guess Life of the Land was involved in that and maybe others in that appeal, you know, questioning their environmental rigor. Um, and it took a while. And uh, then it took another a while uh, for the whole thing to get sorted out. And then it, then it crashes. Uh, it, it, it sounds a little bit like TMT because they got a permit. They thought they did the right thing, you know, dotted the I's, crossed the T's. Um, and then, you know, years later, they find they didn't have a permit, years after they spent all that money. And so, okay, I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, they, they didn't know there was a risk of an appeal and a reversal. What I'm saying is if, um, if investors on the outside, Wall Street, the same people who gave them the $350 million, were to look at Hawaii as a place to invest, they would say, hmm, let's see. We have Super Ferry. Wall Street lost two hundred million on that one. We have TMT. There's uh, I don't know how much money, but it's a lot uh, has been lost already on that one and will be lost on that one. Um, and we have Hohonua. Um, so is it a safe place to invest? Is it a safe place to put the you know the the initial capital in? Is it a safe place to spend the time and energy to get a permit only to find the permit is pulled out from under you? We have a record of that now. Um, so if I were Wall Street, I wouldn't, I wouldn't invest in Hawaii. And this would be um, just another reason. Jay, I don't disagree with you. You make uh, excellent points. And uh, you know, I've certainly thought of that as well. And colleagues I've spoken to, you know, that's, that, that's a major point. I get it. But when it comes to what's best for this island, when it comes to what's best for the state, there are priorities that have to take priority. And the promise of incoming Wall Street money, mainland money, international money coming into the state, uh, when you weigh that against what's best for the people of the state and for the environment of the state, uh, in this case, I absolutely believe the commission made the right decision. Now, the, the, the reality is, of course, I should note to you, Jay, is that a who ho is not necessarily completely done. They could seek to enter into or, or cast their, their hat in the ring for another competitive bidding uh, round with Helco in terms of bringing on new firm generation. Now, whether they'll decide to do that after spending all this money all these years, you know, I'm not privy to that discussion, but it's not as if they can't come back for another shot because the decision was made by the commission, quote, without prejudice, without prejudice. So, Similar to what the commission did under Randy Awase back in what was 2016 with uh, Next Energy uh, buying Hawaiian Electric Industries, that too, that decision was made without prejudice. Now, that said, uh, the very next Monday, Next Era said, Hey, we're out of here, we're done. So, we're all waiting now for Jenny Johnson and Templeton, who are the, the, the firm behind Huo Nua, to, to decide and to announce, Okay, what's their next step going to be? Are they going to sue everybody in sight for treble damages? Are they going to walk away? Are they going to request a reconsideration? I don't know. I don't know. But yeah. uh, it'll be very interesting yeah. to see days to come. What, They're not going to come back, though, Marco. They're not going to come back. And anybody who knows about this reads about this and integrates it with the other things that have happened in terms of offshore investment not going to invest. I, you know, the thing is that Hawaii needs investment. It has always needed investment because it doesn't have investment. You know, the big capital concentrations in Hawaii like, um, you know, well, the, the estate, for example, um, the, uh, the, the uh, employee's retirement system, they have huge, huge uh, funds for investment, but they don't invest locally. Um, we need investment locally, and we can't get it from the local market because there's not that much capital here otherwise. So we need to get it from the mainland. We've always needed that, at least in our lifetime, you and me. But what's happening now is our economy is crashing, um, and we need to rebuild the economy. So to say that we, you know, we don't care about offshore investment, that we have our principles about this, which, you know, really would have been, it would have gone the other way had the Supreme Court decided the other way. The, the original permit granted by the PUC would have stuck and that project would have gone ahead. My, my point only is that we need capital from offshore more now than before. We have to rebuild our economy. The way you rebuild your economy is you bring in capital. And maybe you have to make a little compromise because although it's not coal, you know, and it is fossil fuel, I should, is it fossil fuel? It's burning fuel. Um, you know, at least for a time, people thought it was okay. Uh, so I think, I think this is not, it's a timing question is what I'm saying. But let, let's go on to the next one. The next one is probably the most interesting one on our list today. We have to get to it. 
and that is uh, the Par Hawaii. Par Hawaii is so interesting. Can you can you talk to us about that? Sure. It's just a bit of a sleeper story these days, Jay, because uh, the media, being the herd mentality media that they typically are, have been focused on young brothers, young brothers, young brothers, young brothers, hotels, 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 restaurants, small businesses. And I'm not saying this. it's not justified to look at those aspects of our economy uh, during this uh, difficult time. But uh, there hasn't been much of a herding towards covering Par Hawaii. Par Hawaii operates, to my understanding, the only refineries in the state. After they purchase Chevron, they they are the only folks who do refining of, of crude petroleum here in the state. And it all takes place on Oahu. And understandably, their revenue and their volume, sales volume, has, has been hit majorly, right? Because they provide finished petroleum products to the utility company. They provide finished petroleum products to transportation, transportation, ground transportation, ocean transportation, air transportation. So their volume has gone down. I don't know that percentage. I don't know if that's part of that docket that's been opened by the commission on a fast track kind of urgent, urgent, urgent. We need a decision you know, urgently. But the reality is that it's down substantially. So you have PAR that is essentially asking for a renegotiation and new terms in the, in the agreement between themselves and Hawaiian Electric, amongst other things, okay? And if you're selling less, which they are, right? You're selling less, you're making less money. Okay, that's de facto. Uh, and if you want to try to stay in business, if you want to maintain an adequate profitability or at least not go under the toilet too, too deep, then what do you do when you are selling less? You try to sell whatever less you're selling for more, for more per unit, right? And you can't just willy-nilly say, okay, Hawaiian Lakes, we're gonna charge you 15% more. That's all subject to public utilities commission review and approval, right? And Hawaiian Electric is saying, but there well, has to be an agreement too. There has, there has to be to. an agreement, and there isn't an agreement, right? Well, uh, I am not privy right now in terms of whether there has been an agreement. I mean, there's, you know, there, there are competing interests here. Par has their interests. Hawaiian Electric has their interests. Consumer Advocate has the state's interests and the residents' interests. The Public Utilities Commission is supposed to figure it all out and come up with a decision, right? So ultimately. If there is a, an agreement to, to purchase the reduced volume of petroleum products from PAR at a higher price, who's going to pay the higher price, Jay? Is HECO going to eat it? A no. So they are seeking to pass it on essentially to, to consumers, to rate so payers, this, this right? is a really sensitive issue because everybody is raw about the cost of electricity, the cost of fuel. Well, and Jay, it's not just the cost. It's also, here we go again. GHG, greenhouse gases. So mm -hmm. any type of renegotiation, any type of agreement has to take into account greenhouse gas uh, consequences. And that was mandated, of course, very clearly, right, by the Supreme Court decision. Yeah. So you've got this, this mix here where you've got major players in the state, major uh, that are foreign, well, foreign, foreign, owned outside the state, right, whether it's PAR, whether it's Salt Shook, in the Pacific Northwest that owns Young Brothers, whether it's Macquarie that owns Hawaii Gas, and they've been trying to sell Hawaii Gas now for, for a while. So you've got these major players based elsewhere who are looking at what's going on in our state. They are losing money, right? They're losing money because the volume of their products and services has taken a huge hit. So who is going to make up for the money being lost? And you know, what's going to come out of PAR and HECO and, and the PUC? You know, my crystal ball, I'll show you my crystal ball, Jay. My crystal ball, even though it looks pretty clear, it's actually pretty cloudy when I start asking questions about, <laughs> about PAR and Hawaiian Electric and the PUC. So it's, again, you know, why the media hasn't really been covering this, who knows? They're just fixated. They're herd. They're herd animals. They go to where everybody else seems to. Well, this I mean, this is very stuff dangerous. Is That's dangerous business because it, it's dealing with the uh, lifeblood of of energy for a lot of people, and um, uh, I I can see this as being a dangerous moment, a dangerous uh, inflection point. And the PUC really does have to act right away because if you don't act at all, then then maybe you have a departure, another departure from the state, or you accelerate part of departure. And what do we do then? I mean, we lost uh, sauce. Um, uh, we're going to talk about why, uh, what, what is it, um, PGV in a minute. But we're losing 
these um, capital investments in Hawaii. And it's the same point I made earlier. We really can't afford to lose them. We want them to stay around for a lot of reasons. They help us do business, they help our economy. And one way or the other, we, we can't throw them out of town. Um, and I think if, 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 if there's no solution of this, we, we run big risks. I agree. I mean, what is the solution, Jim? I mean, if it was easy, then you know we would have figured it out by now. But when you've got uh, the, this extraordinary constellation of rather unique events based on COVID, based on the economy, based on uh, multiple other factors, I mean, uh, there's no guidebook. You know, you can't go to Amazon and type in in the search box there. You know, fixing crises in Hawaii in terms of energy or transportation. I mean, there's just no guidebook on this and. I mean, I have the utmost respect for, for the Public Utilities Commission commissioners and their staff. I mean, you couldn't pay me enough now. You couldn't pay me enough to be in the commission. Well, the query is it really, hard. I would put this on the commission. I, I think this is a time for uh, gubernatorial leadership. If, um, if I, as I think, there is no agreement right now, you need an agreement to go forward. You need an agreement to approve. They're going to have to approve something. So what is to approve? They got to have an agreement. And so, uh, you know, the utility um, and uh, PAR uh, should talk at the table and make an agreement, which at least is a good starting point for approval. Um, somebody like a governor has to get in there and, and uh, twist arm, bend elbow, what have you. Talk to them the way it has always been where the chief executive, I mean, of the state, the governor gets in and says, come on guys, let's make a deal. The, the, the future of the state is at risk. I, I want you to make a deal and I will mediate or I'll put one of my, you know, one of my minions to sit with you and mediate and, and get a resolution. Wouldn't that be a good idea, Marco? Well, you know, and if pigs could fly, uh, pigs had wings, they could fly, right, Jay? I mean, <laughs> uh, no disrespect to Governor David Ige, you know, former electrical engineer, and I have a lot of respect for electrical engineers. Uh, that doesn't seem to be really, really his style. And it seems from what I can tell now, our legislature, which uh, broke up uh, last week, you know, they, uh, my friend, Senator Lorraine Inouye, who is uh, one of the chairs of the important committees there, she essentially said, hey, we're waiting for the commission to decide or tell us what to do. So, I mean, there's this kind of finger pointing in terms of, well, we would prefer that you guys decide as in you, the commission decide whether we should pony up 20 million, 25 million to Salt Shook and Young Brothers. You guys decide how to figure out the Par Hawaii thing. So, I, again, my what's you know the, the constellation of stuff going on at a public public utilities commission right now is just mind boggling. Mind boggling. I would use the same word, and I don't think it's fair to lay all these substantive choices on them. These are business I, choices. And, and the business choices should be done by the business people and and uh, the legislature or the governor, mostly the governor should get involved and help them out. We're in a crisis. I don't know why the legislature left. They, they really did not uh, attend to the agenda. They did not intend, uh, attend to, uh, you know, the problems we're suffering from and, and to and to have this uh, Swiss cheese session and now go home uh, really is not a solution. It's just, this is not good for the state, but that's the subject of another show. Why don't we get to uh, PGV with a couple of minutes we have left? What is going on with PGV? We expect it to be back in business, aren't they? So Pune Geothermal Venture, they've been offline since early May 2018, two plus years now. By my calculation, approximately $3 million of lost revenue per month. So you can do the math. That comes out to a chunk of money, right? It's not chump change. And there were, have been two dockets before the commission that would uh, are essentially uh, deciding the, the fate of PGV, uh, docket number one, is regarding the reconstruction of transmission lines, 69 kilovolt transmission, transmission lines. And uh, that was approved not too long ago by the commission because whenever you're dealing with transmission lines, uh, you have to get commission approval. So that's a, a box the PGV can check. Now, the, the next one is regarding this revised power purchase agreement, which has been before them now since late December, if, if memory is correct, very late December, uh, which would be uh, new terms moving forward if and when PGV goes back online. So I don't know the timing of when a decision may come out on that in terms of whether the commission will approve the PPA as is, uh, whether the, the consumer advocate will approve it or recommend approval as is, or whether there will be uh, attempts by the parties, including the, the CA 
or the commission to to improve or to to change the PPA so that it would be in the better public interest of the residents of the state uh, of the residents of, of Hawaii Island. So hopefully there will be something coming soon. I would think you know in the next handful of months uh, in terms of a decision because uh, the parent company Ormat of PGV has sunk a lot of money, continues to sink money into that plant, all with the the goal of bringing it back online. So for everybody's sake, from Helco to Ormat to PGV to the the residents of this island, uh, it would be a good thing that a decision come come before too long. But again, you know, we're talking about competing interests at the commission when the, the house is burning down at Par Hawaii, the house is burning down at Young Brothers. So, you know, somehow the commissioners have to find time for the more, you know, the less crazy urgent stuff to deal with as well, and the less is still important. You know, I mean, all of this has to be taken in light of, of COVID and the economy. And um, you know, I, I feel, and see if you agree with me, I feel that, um, that you have to consider all that uh, in our current business environment, in our state's, uh, in our, in our state's crisis. Um, and it may, it's not business as usual. It's not regulation as usual. We're trying to get through this without having a disaster on our hands. If, if these projects fail, if it all goes down, that's going to add to the disaster and maybe foment a a disaster that's worse. Uh, we don't want to have an apocalypse here. Right now we have increasing cases and our economy is being shut down more again. Um, and uh, uh, gee whiz, where do we go next? It's, it's not a good time. And all we can do is try to make the best of it and not get caught up in anything. Don't you agree with that? Better to have an octopus than an apocalypse, for sure, Jay, and, and work on keeping our crystal ball relatively clean and and see throughable. <laughs> I knew you'd say that, Marco. <laughs> Marco Mangles, though, bringing his wisdom, his experience, his knowledge. And my crystal and his, ball. And his crystal ball to help us understand what's going on and all these things, lots of things in energy in Hawaii, even in the time of a crisis. Thank you so much, Marco. To think that you still believe anything I say, Jay, after all these years, uh, I'm just dumbfounded. But thank you so very much for having me on. <laughs> thank you. Aloha.